good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to everyone in, in this webinar on Seizing Opportunities in Sustainability for the Food Industry. My name is Paul Sin, and I am a senior lecturer from the School of Applied Science at Temasek Polytechnic. I am privileged to be the facilitator for this afternoon's webinar. Now, addressing an organization's sustainability challenges is high on everyone's agenda. BSI and Tamasek Polytechnic have lined up thought leaders and panels from the industry. Today, we have with us Mr. Wan Yang, who will share with us on the Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI for short, and ESG reporting processes as per GRI standard. Dr. Rufai Ha, who will talk about future foods and Tamasic Polytechnic's technology capabilities in this area. Last but not least, we also have Mr. Leonard Chong, who, who will speak about the Asia-Pacific alternative protein landscape. Let us now invite our first speaker, Mr. Wan Yang, please. Yes, uh, ESG and GRI standards are important topics um, nowadays, uh, not just for this webinar, I think uh, in the sustainability community, many people, especially from uh, academic, from uh, corporate, we are all talking about uh, sustainability and ESG. But among ESG, um, the most heated topic nowadays is climate change carbon or near zero. So um, among all the different ESG topics, I will focus on near zero today uh, to lead you, to guide you through the journey of near zero in the food sector, okay? Um, so for today, I think uh, the audience, uh, probably you come from different sector, from different backgrounds. Uh, so I will first, I will give some ideas about the basic knowledge about climate change. What do we mean by net zero, okay? Secondly, I will share with you my ideas, how carbon neutrality transforms our society and the corporate roadmap to net zero. What does it look like? All right, so, and then I will uh, give you some ideas about what is the trend in food sector in terms of sustainability and why should we care about international standards? And last, I will uh, introduce very briefly about BSI and our offers, what kind of uh, you know, services we can offer to help you. So basically uh, for today's presentation of mine, I will give you some basic ideas, some basic systematic uh, framework so that you can follow uh, the international trend. All right, uh, the first section are the basics about the climate change and carbon neutrality or net zero. Okay, so um, here are some of the, you know, what our world looks like, not, not only just in 2022, but also in 2023. So the ripple effect of COVID-19. So we are in the recovery of from COVID-19. That's that's the number one, uh, you know, big issue in our, uh, you know, in our time right now. And the other thing is the Ukraine war has not only caused energy crisis in Europe, but also contribute to famine, lack of food in many poor countries. So that's the other, I think. In, elephant in the room, right? And extreme weather in, for example, you know, uh, the uh, food and energy prices have uh, soared record highs. And also we see, we witness unprecedented climate disasters with historic levels of rain, heat, drought, fires and storms, so on and so forth, right? Um, so, so, you know, extreme weather in, for example, in ASEAN, I claim many people's lives already and displace hundreds of thousands of people, right? And uh, um, millions of the, for example, um, you know, in Africa, millions of people in Africa are starving due to an epic drought. Europe is also facing a worse drought in more than 500 years 
along with scorching heat waves. I think everyone in this webinar, you, you know, more or less, you can feel that the climate has been changing, right? So usually we just relate it to, for example, the natural disaster, but uh, uh, behind it, in essential, it's the, you know, climate change. So first, I would like to uh, give you some, some uh, basic knowledge about you know, greenhouse gas effect. I don't think we need to go deep into sciences. If you came from village or you are familiar with gardening, I think many of you, you know, come for today's webinar, you, you, you come from the background of uh, food or agriculture, right? So you are, you are very familiar with greenhouse, greenhouse. Or for example, in summer, when you get into your car in the parking lot, how do you feel? You feel hot, right? Why? Because the heat is captured in the greenhouse or your car. So this is very similar, you know, uh, in terms of planet. Uh, some gases like carbon dioxide wrap up the earth like a greenhouse, like a greenhouse and make our planet become warmer and warmer. So it's the greenhouse effect. And we call these gases greenhouse gases, okay? Uh, let's now review a little bit high school chemistry. The picture listed major greenhouse gases. Among them, carbon dioxide and methane make the most contributions to global warming. I also want to introduce another conception. You see here, um, the global warming potential, GWP. For example, methane GWP is 28, meaning one kilo methane's global warming impact is equivalent to 28 kilos of CO2, okay? So the GWP of SF6 is 22,800. This means, the contribution of one kilo SF6 to global warming equals to 22,800 kilos of CO2. Though there is only a little SF6 in the atmosphere, but this gas is far more powerful than CO2 to cause global warming, all right? And um, in view of the uh, climate change, the catastrophes climate change will bring, we come up with a conception called net zero. I will give you like 10 seconds to think about what does net zero mean? What do we mean by net zero? Okay, so net zero means achieving a balance between the carbon emitted into the atmosphere and the carbon removed from it. Okay, I think it's very self-explanatory. Do you agree? So for the next section, I will uh, share with you some of my ideas, you know, how carbon neutrality transformed our society and uh, also introduce the corporate roadmap to net zero because I have uh, I have uh, you know entered into you know hundreds of factories. You know, nowadays many business leaders they are wondering you know people are talking about near zero near zero but how should we start from where you know um, they don't have a clue how to start the journey of near zero so. I will give you a very simple roadmap how our businesses can reach net zero, a simple version, okay? So first of all, how does carbon neutrality change our society? I think carbon neutrality in terms of business will be a blue ocean. It's not just about, you know, we comply the regulations, we protect the environment, but at the same time, it means business opportunities for you, okay? I think, um, I think it's very certain because if we don't do it, we'll be doomed. Many countries are, have committed to achieving carbon neutral by 2050. I think Singapore 
Malaysia, many, you know, I think most of the ASEAN countries, they have made the commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, right? So I think carbon neutrality is a game changer, first of all. In essential, carbon neutrality is not just about protecting our planet. I think it's a new industrial and technical revolution. In human history, I think all the previous industrial revolutions are boosted by renew by energy advancement and transition. Think about the first one, the first industrial revolution is fueled by, by coal, right? And powered by steam engine. The second one is fueled by petroleum and electricity. And now we are transitioning, transitioning from fossil fuel to renewable energy. So I, I predict we are, you know, at the corner of another, you know, industrial revolution. So carbon neutrality will be a game changer. I think it's a little like the digital te technology. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, it, it, will, it will transform the existing industries, right? For example, it will change how we produce iron steel, how we grow crops, how we produce our food, right? So at the same time, it creates new businesses like wind turbine, PV panel production, batteries, EVs, carbon trade, carbon financing, so on and so forth, name it. There are new you know, uh, business sectors created, generated from our commitment to carbon neutrality or net zero, right? And we also, we are witnessing stricter compliance requirements from not only just government, but also multinational companies. We can predict that there will be stricter legal and compliance requirements. Uh, companies who can't meet the requirements will be punished and also will be probably removed from multinational companies supply chain list. I will, I, will, I will explain this later, you know, in my presentation. And international competitiveness. Globally, you know, countries and companies who can develop with more efficiency and less emissions will become more competitive. For example, in some of the international bidding, bidders who can demonstrate less carbon emission may win, sometimes even with a higher price. Do we agree? Energy crisis. Also, the prolonged energy crisis is urging us to get rid of reliance on fossil energy, right? A cleaner and stable energy system based on renewable energy needs to be created as soon as possible. So, and also the last one, climate behavior is a reputation. Nowadays, even petroleum company they want to do something about sustainability or carbon reduction, right? Because it has become a reputation in terms of uh, carbon reduction, right? If you don't do anything, I think uh, you won't be looking good in front of the public, in front of the government or your international buyers. So I think carbon neutrality is becoming a blue ocean full of opportunities, full of opportunities. Remember this statement, the you know, here the, in the red texts, carbon neutrality is the most certain goal of human society. It is a long lasting journey, lasting at least between 30 to 50 years, right? And will attract the largest investment in human history. So I think carbon neutrality or net zero will become a blue ocean full of opportunities. Um, so let's see how it transforming our society. Um, you know, power sector and industrial sector, carbon neutrality will change many sectors fundamentally. The first one is power sector. Solar and wind power will become more popular, right? Heavy industries will be transformed profoundly and we will have more green buildings. For transportation, um, fossil fuel vehicles will come to an end. Let me give you a, a data. data. In the year of 2019, you know, in the country where I live, uh, China, uh, the penetration rate for EV is only 6% for 
for EV, the penetration rate. By the end of 2022, the penetration rate in China for EV has become 30%. And I think a similar situation in other, you know, in most of the part in, in, in the world, like the, in, especially in EU, in Europe, in UK, in ASEAN, you know, EVs are taking over, for, you know, taking over from the, you know, fossil fuel vehicles, right? And new materials as well, right? agriculture uh, has been taking a new shape. I'm sure there will be more and more needs for carbon neutral uh, neutrality in agriculture and food sector, like sustainables, palm oil, winery, dairy, we'll have more, you know, carbon neutral, such kind of food, uh, you know, products. And new materials, right, like uh, bio-based materials, graphene, like uh, battery, new, uh, new batteries, for example, and carbon negative technologies like forest carbon sink and CCUS. I don't wanna, you know, uh, explain much about these things. So, okay. Um, if I talk to the CEO of a company, I, I understand many of the attendees for today's webinar, webinar your managers um, in your company, right? So uh, if you wanna, you know, uh, promote sustainability in your company, I think the, the top priority for you is to convince your leader, convince your CEO, convince the senior managers in your company, right? So here is a, very simple, uh, you know, um, um, roadmap to net zero from scratch. First thing you need to do is build the governance structure and strengthen the culture of a company. So make sure they understand what sustainability and net zero means to your company. Okay, so hopefully you can create a, a sustainable culture in your company and get the attention of the senior managers, their commitment, that's very important. We cannot, this is net zero and carbon neutrality. That's a CEO task. That's a, a you know, CEO project. If the CEO is not committed, you won't get anywhere in terms of carbon reduction. So it's top down, absolutely top down. The next thing you wanna do is to measure, assess and set goals and then you streamline production process, improve the energy efficiency because 80% of the carbon emission comes from energy consumption. So energy efficiency is very important. Then you reduce, recycle, reuse the materials or resources. And then try your best to use more renewable energy or green energy, right? Like, uh, you know, wind power or solar power. Manage product level carbon footprint manage your supply chain. And then no matter how hard you try, you still have a certain amount of carbon emitted into the atmosphere. Then you need to buy carbon credits to offset, right? And, and last, you probably wanna adjust product strategy, right? To produce more sustainable product, right? So, and then you will achieve net zero, right? So, so, um, these nine steps are very simple, uh, simple summary of how you can do as a roadmap in your company to achieve net zero. Tell me where you stand, you know, your, uh, you know, in your net zero journey, right? You think, it, you think about it, where, you know, at what stage is your net journey towards net zero? So you just think about it. I think uh, some of the companies probably have been, uh, you know, been planning to do it. Some companies have already uh, do the uh, 14,064 carbon calculation, right? So I think uh, we also, we, every one of us need to think about this question. For section three, I will talk about the trend in the food sector why should we care about international standards as well? So the Consumer Goods Forum is an international NGO for food sector, right? You see, there are one, two, three, four, five, eight priorities brought out by uh, the, this, uh, by this, you know, NGO. So you see, 
social and environmental sustainability have five priorities. So in nowadays, food sector sustainability has become absolutely the focus. So there are five priorities we need to address in, in, in this area. In, for example, like food waste, like plastic waste, like the you know, sustainable packaging, um, so on and so forth. And carbon is absolutely uh, the, one of the important issues in the food sector. So everyone is talking about the same issue, sustainability, right? And uh, if you, if you, uh, you know, if you are in a supply chain, in a value chain, I think you need to consider not only yourself, your size, your facilities, but also you need to consider your supply chain. And your brand is an ecosystem, including your suppliers, including your customers, including you know the transportation, including you know packaging, all those kind of things they you know, make up of an ecosystem for your brand. So you need to pay attention not only to yourself, but also to the whole elements of the ecosystem, okay? And, and uh, the trend in the food sector nowadays, you know, reducing carbon emission has moved to the top of the agenda, right? And the ESG reporting, um, as uh, Paul, mentioned ESG reporting and GRI principles standards have become very important uh, to many of the companies nowadays. And you need to embedding, embed sustainability efforts to make a positive impact on the business performance because nowadays they are all related. Um, sustainability performance uh, is one important part uh, for your you know, business performance nowadays. Okay, uh, renewable energy, resource management, those, you know, life cycle assessment, those are all important topics in the food sector in terms of sustainability. I just list them over here and later I probably will uh, share with you the, my slides. So you can have a, you know, look at all those important issues for the food sector sustainability. All right, so this is a list of top brands who, have made commitment for carbon peak and carbon neutrality. So far, more than 1,600 companies have participated in science-based target initiative, SBTI, and set goals for carbon reduction and carbon neutrality, right? If you, for example, come from a palm oil company or a coffee uh, company, please watch your big buyers closely such as Unilever, right? Denim, Nestle. You need to align your own carbon goals with them. Why? I think I have explained, right? You need to align your goals with them. So have you received expectations or requirements from your global or local buyers on sustainability? I mean, business buyers. I think a lot of you probably have received such kind of expectations already, right? So um, here is a, um, you know, is a uh, diagram um, uh, describing, you know, the, the net zero in a, in a, in a society. Uh, so uh, in renewable energy industries, construction, transportation, all contribute. Those are the main sectors contributing to net zero. And, uh, you know, underneath the blue, the green part are the multipliers, which can multiply your efforts. For example, like uh, investment, green finance, like carbon removal and carbon trade exchange, and also standard and certification. Those are, those are all, you know, the multipliers contributing for our efforts to net zero, okay? So why standards, why should we care about standards and certification? Because what, it, what are standards? I think standards are the summary, very concise summary of best practices of successful companies, right? So, so if you follow the standards, you can also 
apply the best practice, which will make your company become successful. Improved credibility. If you have this certification from, you know, from organizations like BSI, you get our endorsement. You get our endorsement, right? A need for compliance. Because for, um, you know, government set a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 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 compliance requirements. So uh, those are mandatory. So you need to follow certain standards and need to be certified. And buyer's requirement, right? So if, if your buyer want you to become, you know, want you become, uh, uh, you know, carbon neutral, for example, you need to certify yourself. You need to follow certain standards to certify yourself. And investors dem demand. Investor has an important influence on the investee. So investors demand verified ESG data to avoid risk and market access. For example, some people may know CBAM, the carbon tax system scheme uh, imposed by EU, right? So if you, your, your products um, um, need to be exported to more uh, advanced market like EU, probably you need to comply with some of the you know, higher standards. All right, so those are the reasons why we need standards and third party endorsement certification, okay? Here I listed, I mapped the standards, especially ISO standards and past standards contributing in every step to your journey to net zero, okay? So for the first step, you need to measure. We have standards like ISO 14,064 is for greenhouse gas calculation. Like 14,067 is for product level carbon footprint. We all have standards to guide you through the journey to net zero, okay? And here are the map of the standards which can guide you to the, you know, more, more you know, overarching co corporate sustainability, right? the standards supporting your ESG performance. Those are very self-explanatory. Once again, I will share with you the, the, the slides so that you can have a you know, close look at it, all those standards. The last section I will um, you know, quickly uh, introduce uh, our offer and who is BSI. Does anyone does, you know, know about this bridge? Know this? This is a tower bridge in London, okay? BSI was uh, founded by Sir John Wolf Barry. He is a famous civil engineer who designed the London Tower Bridge. And he also oversaw the overall whole construction of the bridge. He played a prom prominent role in the development of industry standardization. He firstly urged to form a committee to focus on standards for iron and steel, because you know, in order to construct this, build this bridge, thousands of iron and steels are used. But more than 100 years ago, there are no standards for all those steel, iron and steel. So, you know, um, he thought it's very necessary to have, you know, standards for the iron and steel. Uh, that's why, you know, he formed BSI. Uh, the BSI, the full name is uh, British Standards Institution. It's the first national standard body in the world. And uh, we were founded in 1901. Um, it, it's also the founding member of the International Standard Organization. And in 1901, BSI introduced the first standard about London's tram track gate, okay? And we are also a purpose-driven organization, which means the profits generated from our business are invested to, for example, to, um, to benefit the society, to develop uh, new standards, et cetera. 
And BSI is an uh, integrated global enterprise. You know, those are some numbers. For example, we have 87 offices. We are operating in um, 193 countries in the world. These are the standards developed by BSI. Some of them you might be very familiar with, for example, like ISO 9001. It came from BS 5750. So the, this is quality management system, right? The standard. So it's very famous. And also 14,067, uh, 14, it came from past 2050. It's about the product carbon footprint. Okay, and here is uh, uh, a uh, you know some introduction about uh, the the only available global standard for carbon neutrality that is PAS twenty two twenty sixty. That's the only standard for carbon neutrality in the world right now, and probably next year will be upgraded to ISO. 14,068. All right, um, and last but not the least, uh, I will introduce very quickly about uh, you know, our uh, carbon neutral product kite mark, which could be applied to the food product, okay? Food product. So someone may ask how the customer, the ordinary customer uh, uh, to, uh, to, to distinguish a sustainable food product from in the market. So we are introducing the kite mark. Um, um, so for more than 100, this kite mark has been existing for more than 100 years, uh, recognized as a symbol of outstanding quality, safety and trust across the world, okay? So this is one example of the kite mark uh, in, uh, in the food, right? This is a, uh, I think this is uh, honey, right? So basically to uh, endorse the high quality of, of this food product. And we are introducing, we also, we have introduced carbon neutral product kite mark. So if your food product has achieved carbon neutrality, we can give you the kite mark to prove that, to demonstrate to the customer in the market that your, your, your food, your product are carbon neutral. Okay, there is also a QR, uh, it also comes with a QR code. So the customers, they can use their phone, smartphone to scan, to get the information, uh, you know, how much, for example, how much emission, carbon emission uh, from this product and how much, you know, how, how is the uh, carbon offset plan uh, associated with this, uh, you know, carbon neutral product, for example. And the BSI's kite mark for carbon neutral products, you know, like other uh, kite marks, is there to reassure your product. It's a promise from a third party independent body that your product has achieved carbon neutral, you know, uh, carbon neutrality are against a very, you know, strict certification, all right? Okay, so I will stop over here. Uh, last, I will say, I will say uh, you know, we want to work with all of you um, to achieve a sustainable future. I think uh, we don't have to wait for uh, for future to come. I think future should be created by all of us uh, towards sustainability. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Paul. Thank you, Wan Yang. Now, onward to our second speaker. Our second speaker will speak about future foods and Tomasic Polytechnic's technology capabilities in this area. Dr. Rufaya, please. So very good afternoon to everyone. And thank you very much for attending BSI TP webinar today. I am Rufaya, the domain chair for TP School of Applied Science Future Foods Domain. And in this presentation, I'll be sharing with you the various future foods technology capabilities that my team have here in TP. So one of the growing food trends that are driving this transition to sustainable food production is cellular agriculture. And cellular agriculture focuses on two major roles, 
uh, major goals, sorry, which are the sustainable food production and also food security. And what is very interesting about it is that it integrates many different aspects, uh, such as digital, physical, biotechnological, and food science to produce new food products. Um, two key biotech technologies that it uses are the precision fermentation and also cellular or tissue engineering principles to actually produce protein or cell products um, via this biotechnology procedures instead of the traditional animal or plant agriculture. So briefly in pre uh, precision fermentation, uh, basically it involves growing a microbial hosts as cell factories to actually produce your functional uh, food ingredients. And in cellular or tissue engineering, um, animal cells are taken from live animals and they are grown in bioreactors to produce the various components or parts of muscle tissue. However, despite the rapid growth of this new uh, industry and also scientific advances that have shown the feasibility of these technologies, there are still challenges that remain in advancing this cellular agriculture on an industrial scale. So here are some of the challenges. Um, I don't mention everything, but here are some of them uh, that we are facing and the industries are also actively working on it. So some of it here are like the types of cell lines that you have to use to grow your cell-based uh, meat or cell-based seafood. Uh, the formulation of cell culture media with uh, using inexpensive ingredients, uh, which are the nutrients for the cells to grow, and also optimization of bioprocesses design, such as using bioreactors with um, very unique different features uh, for different stages of the production of the upscaling of the cell expansion. Um, and of course, we have scaffolding and structuring where you have to choose your edible scaffolds or materials that you can fine tune to allow generation of your desired meat texture. And also in precision fermentation, you need to look for choices uh, for novel or sustainable and inexpensive feedstock for your microbes. And hopefully you have to come up with like processes and manufacturing, proce uh, manufacturing systems that actually allow you to produce ingredients that are typically of uh, greater purity. And these functional ingredients that you get out of uh, these microbes, you can actually use them to improve the sensory characteristics and also functional attributes of your plant-based uh, products or cultivated meat. And of course, not forgetting right now, many countries are actively establishing a regulatory approval pathways uh, and also like any new food, uh, the ultimate success of alternative protein-based uh, food, it, it, it really depends on the customer acceptance. Uh, and now you have a lot of researchers that are studying or focusing on consumer attitudes. And also there are ongoing efforts in many different countries to increase public awareness on cellular agriculture. So in uh, TP, uh, ASC Future Foods domain, or in short, I will call it uh, TPFFD, we have basically three different arms. We have the research and development arm, uh, the lab-grown food development and nutrition profiling arm, and lastly, the education and outreach arm. So in the R&D, we work with industry partners to develop and optimize their technologies for creating their raw materials and also produce uh, I mean, we recommend different um, upscaling process of producing their products using uh, bioreactors. Under the lab grown food development and nutrition profiling, we take these materials, the created raw materials from industry partners and develop them into consu consumer food products. So it involves a lot with our team of chefs where we look into recipes, improving the organoleptic properties of these uh, raw materials in incorporated into food. And lastly, as an educational institution, we do revamp our curriculum by collaborating with industry partners in certain key topics, such as cellular agriculture, synthetic bio, ethics, and regulations. Under, under the uh, TPFFD domain, uh, which is the research and development program, we are pretty much focused on two different arms. First is the cellular and tissue engineering, and secondly is the microbial metabolic engineering. 
For cellular and tissue engineering, we are focused on helping uh, industry partners to develop edible plant-based scaffolds with their raw materials in order to come up with enhancement of their cultivated uh, meat textures. Uh, and also we look at scale up expansion of their raw materials. In this case would be their cells. This is very actively ongoing right now. And at the moment, we are currently in the process of setting up our microbial metabolic engineering uh, arm, where we specifically use this technology to produce uh, either plant derived ingredients to support uh, cell growth, where we can use them in the cell culture media and also uh, ingredient formulation using this microbial engineering. And these ingredients do not need to be used just in the food industry, but also in health or even in health supplement and tissue regenerative uh, industries. So listed here are TPFFD capabilities, and we are currently using them to actually support our industry partners. Uh, we are able to perform uh, edible uh, plant-based cellular scaffolding design and fabrication. And we also have the capacity to actually use uh, electromagnetic fields as a form of uh, physical enhancement for cell growth uh, and also for supporting industry partners in bioprocess design for upscaling of their cellular expansion. We also have the capability to process, extract and characterize plant-derived exosomes, which are currently gaining uh, traction. I will explain uh, later. Uh, and also we have uh, the cap capability to uh, formulate cell culture media using plant-based uh, ingredients. And we have the fermentation capability with our scientists here in TP to convert bio-waste products into novel food ingredients that can be used um, in several downstream applications. And lastly, we have chefs with their culinary expertise who can actually enhance the taste and nutrition profile of the alternative protein food products. And currently uh, coming our way is uh, we are actually working on 3D bioprinting and our microbial metabolic engineering uh, capabilities. Here is a schematic figure that shows the overall conception of the process of a clean meat production. As you can see, it has several different components starting from cell culture media formulation where we can do optimization for you and also we can do optimization of the cells and the microcarriers that will be used in our bioreactors for both cell proliferation and cell, differ uh, cell differentiation. And come up to, from the uh, cell proliferation and differentiation, we will harvest these cells and we can actually use them for tissue scaffolding. And in the end, to get your final product, either a cultivated meat or a cultivated fish. So one of our partners here, Umami Meats, uh, they have the patented technology where they can actually harvest fibroblasts and expand them from grouper and many different other fishes in their list. And we can actually use them either in wet or in dry form. In, dry, uh, in wet form, you can actually uh, take the cells and cultivate them on plant-based scaffolds. And in the dry form, they become the raw ingredients for you to incorporate into the plant, uh, edible plant-based uh, scaffolds for you to create actually a, a final product of a cultivated meat. At the same time, um, we also have this partnership with NUS and ourselves, where we have shown that actually by using downward directed magnetic field exposure, just using magnetic field, you can actually result in enhancement of cell growth and this is independent of the various coil device system that we use. So as you can see here from the graph, those that are cells that are exposed to downward direction of these magnetic fields actually show enhanced cell number. But what was interesting is that it does not only um, increase the cell growth, but what we found that it also enhances the production of extracellular vesicles that contain exosomes, okay, which will, uh, I will highlight uh, further in uh, the importance of these exosomes in my later slides. So this slide is to show a part of our cell processing lab facility, which is fully equipped. We have the class 100K and class 10K clean room, and they are fully equipped with biosafety cabinets, incubators, centrifuge, water bath, cell counter, biochemistry analyzers, and bioreactors. So we are here to, uh, these lab facilities are able to be used and we can provide our services to our industry partners. 
So I talk about these exosomes and you might be wondering what are these exosomes, right? It's actually gaining uh, traction um, because of uh, many different reasons. Uh, but I will start off with um, what are actually plant-derived exosomes. They are actually a class of extracellular vesicles which are found in the cells. Okay, and they are pretty unique because they carry many different kinds of molecules that are involved in cell-to-cell -cell communication. And these exosomes are really very tiny. They are about three to 150 nanometers. And they are first formed inside the cell bodies. And then they will fuse with the membrane of the cells and they will be released into the extracellular environment. And then they are termed as exosomes. And this field of exosomes are gaining traction because these exosomes actually contain many important biomolecules, such as nucleic acids, like the DNA and RNA, proteins, lipids, and metabolites. And you can actually use these exosomes for many different downstream application. So in TP, we are able to, uh, we have done it previously with cell cultures. So we grow stem cells and we culture them in a media. And then after a certain period of time, we actually collect this conditioned media and we do a sample processing where the, we, and, uh, the liquid or these uh, conditioned media are subjected into serial centrifugation to actually remove all the unwanted materials. And you have a very clear conditioned media where you then do an ultrafiltration to get uh, to concentrate the proteins. From there, then you can actually analyze them. You use a flow cytometry analysis for the different sizes and for the different specific markers. Bearing in mind, the different sizes of the exosomes actually have different kinds of uh, functions. Okay, whether they are, they are, you know, they are highly, uh, they carry a highly um, load high load that are very useful for certain applications and with certain sizes they ca carry less load of certain biomolecules so, so they, are, they actually varies so that's where you have to do detailed characterization of these uh, exosomes so all this work are actually translatable to uh, even food sources so you can actually use different kinds of food and we can actually do the same thing we can extract the uh, exosomes and characterize them and also these will be taken by the companies to do formulation for different types of applications such as health, therapeutic, and cosmetics. So this is something that we are about to also start with one of our industry partners who are very keen in looking into the applications of exosomes. At the same time, we also have the Precision Fermentation Lab where we can uh, actually be, uh, we have very um, dedicated scientists very experienced for several many years actually uh, they are able to process uh, bio waste products into functional food ingredients they take in uh, food byproducts and they are able to extract nutrients from it from the the peels the fruit peels they can also extract the dietary fibers and also let microbes are growing on the uh, bio waste products and extract out the beneficial metabolites that you can then use for functional food ingredients. So this one is really very active ongoing. And also as an educational uh, institution, we do outreach programs uh, to actually educate others and also share our capabilities to industry partners. And we do present in conferences. And the latest one is the first Malaysian cultivated meat conference, which was jointly organized by Cell Agritech and also Bioeconomy Corporation. Uh, it actually brought together uh, different government agencies and also biotech industries, regulatory bodies, stakeholders, researchers, and also many other others that are involved in the cellular agriculture or aqu aquaculture space. And they actually share each, uh, with each other the knowledge and also help each other to gain a foothold in this growth market. And in this conference, uh, many different things were discussed. The three key things that was discussed was on food policy and regulation on cultivated meat, and also what are the cost drivers in the cultivated meat industry, and also uh, lastly, the halal st uh, status of cultivated meat. And during this uh, conference, uh, Tomase Poli was able to share our knowledge our research and expertise and capabilities to all the partners in the cultivated meat and seafood space. From the various conferences and sessions that we have uh, got involved, both locally and internationally, we have built our various networks and partnerships as shown here. 
And actually, my team are really looking forward or be very happy to discuss any new potential co collaborations with anyone here uh, today that is attending the webinar. So with this, uh, I end my presentation. Uh, you feel free to reach out to me. And thank you very much for listening. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Rufaiha. Next, we have Mr. Leonard Chong, who will speak about the alternative protein landscape in the Asia Pacific region. Let's welcome Mr. Leonard Chong. Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for joining me today. Um, I'll be talking about the APEC alternative protein landscape. I'm, I'm quite glad that uh, Dr. Ruhai, Rufaiha went before me so that I don't have to cover so much about the scientific parts about alternative protein and can focus more about uh, what the industry is looking at uh, in this sector. Um, so just uh, before we begin, I can do a short introduction about myself. I know that Paul already did an introduction, but I think uh, yeah, it would be good to remind uh, some of you and also I think uh, some of them might have joined later. So I'm a scientific fellow at uh, Big Idea Ventures. Um, and what that means is that I conduct scientific review for the companies that we invest in. Um, and also post-investment, I also help out with the scientific mentorship and connecting our companies with mentors. So um, the reason I can do this is because uh, I'm a food scientist. I was working as a research assistant in NUS, uh, working on food safety, food analysis, novel food technologies, and also uh, completed my master's in food science uh, in NUS as well. So um, to those who are not aware of uh, who we are as Big Idea Ventures, um, we are essentially a hybrid uh, accelerator and venture capital that invests in early stage alternative protein companies. Uh, we were dubbed the number one investor in food tech globally in 2022. And that's because of our investment in over 100 companies over the past four years. We have a global presence. So we have a New York office, a Paris office, and a Singapore office that covers the Americas, uh, the EU, and the APEC region, respectively. And we also work with a lot of corporates um, as our limited partners and also as people within our network. So these are some of the companies that we've invested in in the last four years. Um, you can see that they fall into these three categories, and uh, these are very well-known categories and well-established within the alternative protein scene. So first is the plant-based category, and that is involving your uh, materials like your texturized vegetable protein uh, using pea and soy to produce products. Uh, and you'll see the, a lot of these products in the market uh, today, whether it's your plant-based milks or your plant-based meats. Um, the second category is your fermentation enabled technologies. So this category can, can be further divided into two subcategories. One is biomass fermentation, and that is usually involving the growing of a certain mycelium or a certain biomass uh, from either fungi or yeast or some kind of microorganism and consuming um, that as your food. So um, common products in the market uh, include, and, uh, for example, tempeh, uh, and also you see uh, this brand of uh, meat called corn. Uh, those are all using biomass fermentation. And the other um, segment is something that Dr. Rufaiha covered, which is precision fermentation. So essentially using um, a microorganism as a host to create recombinant target proteins, for example, uh, dairy proteins, growth factors, um, and so on and so forth. And the last, I think, is the one that is, uh, you know, getting the most uh, interest in alternative proteins, which is your cultivated meat sector. So, uh, I mean, I think to the layman, that's essentially like growing meat in a test tube. But I think we've gone much further than that. Uh, I think that there's a lot of steps and challenges that uh, Dr. Rifaya also covered. And these are some of the companies that are working on it. So we not only invest in companies that are working on the end product of creating that final piece of meat, but we also invest in companies that are providing solutions along the value chain. So people who are providing solutions for animal-free culture media uh, or bioreactor design or process optimization, um, those are people we invest in as well. So back to the topic of today, um, I'll be splitting it into four categories. The first is the investment landscape. So generally how investors are looking at this scene. Uh, the second is the consumer insight. So how consumers are perceiving alternative proteins. The third is the industry perspective. So how the corporates, the startups, the manufacturers are looking at it. And lastly is the regulatory governance. So essentially how the government is looking at this problem. 
So I'll start with the investment landscape. So um, if anyone is new to the alternative protein scene and wants to get uh, to learn more about it, uh, I would recommend this um, institute called GFI, which is the Good Food Institute. So they prepare a lot of documents about alternative proteins, uh, whether it's to educate you about the data, the most recent data, or whether it's to teach you about the science behind alternative proteins. So this uh, graph was actually extracted um, from one of their um, material. So it's talking about the amount uh, of investment in alternative proteins, especially in the APEC region. So we can see that um, year on year, this industry is still growing within APEC. Uh, and if you look at the colors of the bars, uh, we can see plant-based is still growing, fermentation is still growing, cultivated meats are still growing. So the main difference between APEC and the rest of the world, I would say, is in the plant-based industry. Um, a lot of times you'll see that there's a lot of different brands right now in the, in the supermarket. And what we say is that the plant-based industry is quite saturated with companies um, creating all kinds of different products. So globally, what you'll see for the investment landscape is that uh, it's starting to hit this plateau um, because investors are thinking there are enough companies that are established already. We don't need to further invest into this sector. Um, but you can see for APEC, there's still um, a growth in this sector. And I think that this is uh, because a lot of uh, countries in APEC are still quite um, new to the to the whole concept of alternative proteins. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities there. So we see uh, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia that are developing uh, products that are very specific to their own cuisines, like, um, um, like companies in Thailand developing basil, uh, basil chicken. Or we can see uh, companies in Philippines developing their adobo. Um, we also see uh, markets like China, which you know, are big drivers of like the APEC region's uh, landscape. Um, they are beginning to accept plant-based um, products. So uh, in, especially in terms of like convenience products, ready to eat products. So, and that would, uh, that would lead to this um, growth that you currently see. And in the other two sectors, I would say it's quite well aligned with um, the global scene, um, especially in terms of fermentation, it's growing rapidly. Uh, and I think, yeah, again, like uh, bringing up what Dr. Rufaiha said, precision fermentation is the one that everyone is looking at right now as a way to very sustainably produce protein um, and also in a way that is nature identical and uh, mostly like easily commercializable. So if you look at um, the global startup composition um, versus what a VC like BIV um, invest in, you can see that this aligns well with what I've stated previously. So obviously there are a lot of plant-based companies out there forming 82% of uh, the, the startups. Whereas uh, you can see that for us, we don't invest so much in uh, plant-based companies and actually a large majority of them fall into the cell-based and uh, fermentation um, categories. So uh, I think that a big reason for this is that um, oftentimes the infrastructure and the equipment and the um, talent that's needed for cell-based and fermentation enabled technologies uh, is often more uh, intensive. And so we predict that a lot of these startups will need a lot more capital to be able to achieve their goals. And hence, uh, that is where the investment is going. So moving on, uh, I'll be covering a bit about consumer insights as well. Um, so I like to split it up into the who, what, where, why, and how. So firstly, we'll look at who are the people who are buying alternative proteins. So you'll see that a large majority of them are actually female. Uh, in terms of the age category, we see Gen Zs and Millennials. I think these are people who have kind of either grown up or from an early age been exposed to this term of alternative proteins or uh, plant-based meats and hence are more receptive to this. Uh, you'll see that a large number of them also have kids at home. So that means that they are thinking about not just um, their own nutrition, but also the nutrition of their families, uh, considering what, you know, um, yeah, all the people in their family need to eat. And also um, you see that most of them are also college graduates. So you'll see that um, this represents a more educated crowd who's thinking about the things that go behind their food. Uh, rather, so they'll be looking and scrutinizing at the food labels, uh, the ingredient list and things like that. Uh, we also see some um, cate special categories. So um, people who are creating products for the elderly, uh, for infants and children, and also for pets uh, to cater to like, specific niche um, markets in the alternative proteins. 
Okay, next we move on to why these people are um, choosing alternative proteins. So the first is sustainability. Um, I think just now um, when Wan Yang was talking all about sustainability and ESG, that's one big thing, uh, one big driver behind alternative proteins. We believe that the current, uh, you know, animal agriculture industry is not very sustainable in terms of its carbon emissions, in terms of its resource usage, uh, water usage, uh, you know, and and. It's also creating a lot of pollution. So uh, a lot of these startups, the drive behind it is to create a solution that is similar to what we are obtaining right now, but a lot more sustainably produced. The second is health. Um, so you'll see that uh, when we are trying to create alternative proteins, we also think about the nutritional uh, composition of these products. So uh, we try to use high protein products, um, products that are low in the unhealthy fats, and uh, also trying to incorporate functional compounds, functional ingredients into these products and reducing the number of food additives. So trying to create a more clean label product. And another reason um, is also ethics. So uh, people are talking about how a lot of these uh, animal agriculture facilities uh, might be overcrowded or might not be very um, uh, like pleasant for the animals. So that's one of the reasons they are moving towards uh, alternative proteins because uh, usually there's less animals involved. And the last uh, is religion. So religion uh, is something that has existed for a very long time, I would say. Um, and uh, I would say that the shift to alternative proteins right now is not um, because of religion, but I would say that uh, many people are choosing the new alternative products, uh, alternative protein products over maybe their traditional tofu or binkert um, and things like that. And, and that's uh, mostly, I would say, in Asia. So um, then we move on to the what. So what are these people looking for when they want to buy an alternative protein product? So I think we have to split them uh, into a few categories. So um, in case um, people are not familiar, uh, the vegans are the people who consume only plant products. Vegetarians are open to consuming products like egg and dairy. The flexitarians are people who um, can consume meat, but would consume uh, a plant-based diet uh, on a regular basis. And the omnivores are basically everyone else. So um, you'll see that for these different uh, categories, there are actually different concerns about what uh, they want in their alternative protein products. Uh, for the vegans, they obviously want a lot more clean label. Uh, they don't mind that uh, their product does not taste like meat at all. And they are looking for healthier whole protein sources. So they'll consume things like the beans, the legumes as part of their diet. And I think that they are a bit more um, adventurous in terms of the things that they want to uh, try. And on the other side, we have the on the fences. So the, that will be your flexitarians, your omnivores. And you'll see that actually that actually forms the largest um, like uh, composition of uh, consumers out there. And so a lot of times for the startups that are working on this, um, they need to look at this market rather than target the vegans and vegetarians. So you'll see that um, um, They'll, these on the fences, they'll be looking at taste and texture. They want their product to taste and feel like meat. They're thinking about cost. How much does it compare to traditional meat? They're thinking about familiarity. Uh, how much does this resemble meat? How much? Um, how easy it is for me to incorporate this new product into my already established cuisine or diet? Um, yeah, so I think this, this slide is quite important. Uh, in the sense of helping us to understand uh, how to design an alternative protein product. Okay, then we'll be looking at where next. So um, if I, as, as I understand, there are quite a lot of international audience um, in this webinar. So um, just looking at this diagram of uh, Southeast Asia, you'll see that um, actually the demand for alternative proteins uh, is very dependent upon, I would say, the um, spending power of these countries. So you'll see that uh, more advanced countries uh, with higher spending power are looking more towards alternative proteins, whereas more uh, emergent countries or even the um, like I would say the more the countries with less spending power um, are still focused on their traditional products and I think that that makes a lot of sense because for them uh, they are still uh, thinking about food security they're thinking about cost 
uh, whereas um, for the more advanced countries, there's always uh, more spending power and more like flexibility to choose what they want to consume. Okay, then we talk about when. So when do we consume alternative uh, proteins? So you'll see right now, if you're in Singapore, that uh, it's quite readily accessible in supermarkets. There's always at least one fridge cabinet that's de dedicated to alternative proteins. Uh, we also can see on the e-commerce platforms, whether it's through your TikTok live streams, uh, your Red Mart uh, um, online mar uh, markets, um, and or whether it's through directly um, from these brands on their websites, they sell the alternative protein products. Um, yeah, so e-commerce is one channel. And the last is your cafes and restaurants. So um, there are a couple of vegan, sorry, vegan restaurants and hawker centers and uh, QSR chains that are opening up um, to alternative proteins and incorporating them into their menus. So then the last question is how, how do we help to further promote uh, alternative proteins to the mainstream consumer? So you'll see that um, this uh, analysis by uh, Boston Consulting Group uh, shows that if you want to have a quick win um, in terms of marketing your product, you need to limit uh, your use of terms like vegan or vegetarian in your labels. And also uh, one big thing is that people need transparency nowadays. So they want to know what your product is made of. Is it soy? Is it pea? Uh, where do you source it from? There yeah, are things like that. And also um, in, in terms of occasion dependence, so I think that depends on uh, what your product is and uh, who you're targeting. Um, people also value um, highlighting the product sensory appeal. So maybe coming up with recipes uh, to use your product in uh, everyday cuisine and also highlighting the health benefits. Okay, next I'll move on to um, industry perspectives. So um, again, a document by GFI. If you look at um, this document, you'll see that the top left is meat, uh, top right is cheese, uh, bottom left is uh, milk, and bottom right is uh, yogurt. So these are like the four big markets for plant-based products right, uh, right now. And you'll see that... Um, in general, I would say that uh, Europe and North America is dominating the purchase of uh, all these plant-based products, except for milk, where you can see APEC is actually um, the the primary category. Um, sorry, the, the primary um, market that is uh, purchasing milk, and you'll see that uh, this makes a lot of sense because um, I think that plant-based milks is not a foreign concept to a lot of Asian countries. Um, we've been drinking like soy milk for a very long time. We've been, uh, you know, drinking all kinds of like oats as um, like a meal supplement and things like that. And yeah, and if you go to actually, um, I saw a LinkedIn post recently um, where this person went to China and saw uh, the variety of um, this brand called Oatly. So uh, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Oatly, but they are like an oat milk brand. And uh, he was very surprised by how much variety of Oatly products there were in the market as compared to um, America. So there were like um, the normal Oatly milks, there were barista blends, there were milk teas, all created out of this product. So yeah, you can see that clearly explains this, um, this statistic here. Okay, then another industry um, concept that uh, is coming up is hybrids. So hybrids is the concept of combining different technologies um, to create a final product. So um, the reason why you want to do this is because you can see that for each technology, they each face their own um, challenges. And so you want to be able to use um, different technologies to be able to maximize the pros of each and minimize the cons of each. Um, so one example, and I think the most classic example, is to combine cultivated meat uh, ingredients with plant-based ingredients. So um, we have this company called um, Piece of Meat, uh, which is working on cultivated fat. And you can see that they actually pulled uh, a lot of plant-based companies on whether they would use cultivated fat in uh, their product. And you can see that these are the general um, drivers for them wanting to use cultivated fat in their products. So whether it improves taste and texture, whether it makes it more clean label, yeah, things like that. And so I think you can see that uh, there's starting to be a lot of these kinds of hybrid products in the market. Um, 
for alternative proteins because it just helps to accelerate the go-to-market of these products. Uh, whereas if you chose to uh, create a completely uh, cultivated product, it might take you know, 10 years to reach the market. Um, another thing is collaborations, which is uh, in line with hybrids. So I think that uh, when we're talking about combining different technologies to create a final product, uh, oftentimes, you know, one company is working on one particular technology, but if you're able to come uh, to have collaborations, you're able to combine uh, the efforts of two different uh, corporations um, to come together to create that final end product. So you can see the big companies, Nestle, uh, working with like a startup like Future Meat Technologies. And then um, you also can see in Singapore, there's this company uh, called Love Handle. Um, that is working with this company, uh, I believe in, in Europe called Meetable to create um, their own line of hybrid products. And lastly, market penetration. So you can see uh, where these products are ending up um, and where uh, the industry thinks it makes most sense um, to launch their products. So um, as covered previously, you'll see restaurants you will see your fast food chains, your QSR chain. So this impossible product is actually um, a Starbucks product. And then you'll see your regular street food, your hawker, hawker center food. Um, they are trying to incorporate there. And lastly, you also see in your supermarkets. So yeah, those are some uh, places that people are looking at to launch their products. Okay, so the last section, I'll be talking about regulatory governance. So I think uh, the most common like uh, concern for alternative protein uh, products is whether it is considered a novel food. So the definition of novel food um, based on the Singapore Food Agency uh, is food and food ingredients that do not have a history of safe use. So it means that if it's not currently anything that uh, an ingredient that is not uh, used in any current food product, it will have to go through the novel foods uh, framework. And that often means a lot more testing and a lot more uh, regulations before your product can enter the market. And I think the reason for this is because uh, when it is, has no history of safe use, then we are worried about uh, like things like toxins, allergens, um, contamination by you know, pathogenic microorganisms, things like that. Um, and so that's something that uh, needs to be considered uh, when you are designer, designing a product, whether you will be considered a novel food. Another thing is called uh, standards of identity. So I think that's a big thing uh, in a couple of regions uh, where they feel that, uh, for example, the label of what is considered a milk or whether what is considered a meat um, is very well defined. And when alternative proteins comes in and they want to create like a plant-based milk, a plant-based meat, uh, oftentimes there'll be lobbies that uh, complain that this uh, cannot be considered as uh, milk or meat. And I think that's something to think about in terms of marketing for an alternative protein product. Uh, and it's very region specific. Um, so you'll see that, uh, for example, in Singapore, uh, in the sale of food act, uh, they do define that milk uh, will be reserved exclusively for, describe, uh, for describing milk. And uh, any build-up product, uh, it must be, uh, uh, sorry, and milk is considered as the normal memory uh, secretion of cows, buffaloes, and goats. But um, you'll see that they also have a clause that states that alternative protein products should be qualified by appropriate terms such as mock, cultured, or plant-based to indicate their true nature. So it's okay to label um, a product as plant-based milk as long as the consumers are aware that this is not uh, actually the product that uh, this term is normally associated with. Um, another thing is cultivated meat. So that's very linked to um, the novel uh, foods category. So it's, I mean, designing uh, meat in a, in a petri dish, right? And that has to go through a lot of regulations uh, to make sure it's approved. So um, Singapore is actually very lucky to be one of the first, um, to be actually the world's first um, uh, country to approve cultivated meat sales. So um, you, you can actually buy uh, a piece of cultivated meat um, in Singapore. And um, you will see that subsequently there's a lot of follow-up. So US was the second country to actually um, approve um, this company called Upside Foods. 
And then uh, Singapore released another piece of news that they approved serum-free media uh, in, in cultivated meats. Um, and then you'll see uh, Vow Foods in Australia um, is also starting the regulatory process. And in Israel as well, uh, they're getting the green light to actually uh, start this whole novel foods cultivated meat framework. So the question becomes who next, right? So there's a lot of companies, uh, so a lot of countries right now that are playing catch up. So countries like Canada, Australia, um, the EU, who are all looking at how they can best uh, regulate cultivated meats and uh, so that it's safe uh, for the consumers and can be launched into the market. Yeah, so um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you so much for your time. If you uh, feel anything, um, it's interesting about my talk today and want to connect on LinkedIn to discuss more. This is my QR code. Feel free to scan it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll pass the time back to Paul. Thank you, Leonard. That was uh, very comprehensive, very informative. We have come to the end of today's session. Time flies, doesn't it? I'm quite sure that it has been a fruitful session for all of us. Most of all, I would like to thank all of you for taking time out to attend this webinar. We hope it has been useful to you. Should you have any queries or would like to know how we can assist you in your sustainability journey, please feel free to contact us. So take care everybody and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Bye-bye.